Going in, everyone. Let me get this figured out here. All right. So, uh, talking a little bit about Bermuda grass management, um, I suggested you know that this would be a good topic for us to kind of cover this time of year because, as you guys know, management starts now uh, for any plans in the fall. Um, so, I really have been kind of an advocate of getting away from Bermuda grass while. It is something that is in our climate here in Southwest Oklahoma that we use uh, still, um, but I try to diversify as, as much as possible to avoid uh, unnecessary expenses. So uh, the highlight of this is gonna be getting away from your inputs uh, that you have involved in Bermuda grass production, whether that's haying, spraying, fertilizer, uh, or the other such costs by using diversity and and grazing management. So, so with this presentation, I want to keep you guys in mind that uh, don't burn your opportunities for temporary temporary comfort. Uh, kind of keep an open mind for everything that you come across. Uh, it's something that uh, um, this isn't a isn't a silver bullet by any means of what I've been doing uh, with the Bermuda grass, but it's something that's uh, proved worthwhile as long as I gave it an opportunity. So, so, and so with that being said, uh, high maintenance Bermuda, I always call as a temporary comfort. Um, that's something that we like having. Everybody says you want good looking Bermuda. When I moved down here, uh, well, I had good looking Bermuda and also about when broke doing that. So that's something that uh, uh, I want to get away from as a producer. Uh, I highly encourage other people's getting getting away from and we're seeing a, a drastic change. Uh, the question is how do we get away from this high maintenance or this Bermuda Triangle as I call it. Um, because we can get an easily get in a rhythm of fertilizer. Because we fertilize that, that pasture we end up having to spray because the weeds come on. And then of course we get extra production on the Bermuda grass. We hay, we hay again, and we hay as much as we can throughout the summer, just to haul all that hay around the countryside and give it back out to the cows in the winter time frame. So it's a constant cycle of managing Bermuda through the summer and producing as much hay and putting in a bunch of inputs into it. And so that's something that we're trying to get away from. So how do we replace these three main expenses? Um, the three tools that I use is diversification, rotation, and then stockpiling forages. And I use both annuals and perennials, I should say, in stockpiling forages. I don't leave either one of those out. Uh, both of them are great tools. Both of them have ups and both of them have downs. So, um, But uh, these are kind of my three main concepts that I, I use in my operation. There may be other uh, small tools, but these are gonna be the three that we're gonna focus on today. Um, the biggest thing I look at in diversifying is timing. Uh, Bermuda grass particularly, if you can see on this chart here, is primarily production May through September. It starts to fall off in September. Some guys will fertilize to get a little bit more growth in October, but that's not gonna be proven to provide a lot of extra biomass, a lot of extra yield. Uh, I'd like to also point out on here uh, species like alfalfa, red clover, uh, ladino clover, uh, some of the small grains. And so I like to pay attention to these bell curves of production when I'm looking at diversifying a system. This could be Bermuda grass, this could be Caucasian blue stem, as you can see here switchgrass. Uh, I don't try to have any type of monoculture on my property as, as much as possible. And uh, I'd, I highly encourage to get those legumes in there, those broad leaves, those tap-rooted species. The biggest thing is uh, mimicking mother nature. Uh, so what, what, what do you have in your pastures? Um, that's the first tool that I use is observation. What annual weeds that are coming into that Bermuda system. Is it mare's tail? Is it 
Canadian thistles, and then finding a species that may match up with that, that system. So deep rooted tap roots, broad leaves, uh, maybe a legume plant uh, to fill that niche. Now I wouldn't say that we're ever gonna replace those weedy annual opportunists uh, completely, but we definitely can fill that niche to where we give them competition and eliminate that spraying program. Uh, the other diversification, like I said before, is di diversification of roots. As you can see, and you've probably seen this before, is the perennial uh, prairie. Primarily Bermuda grass is going to have, being that it's sod, is going to have its root system in the top 12 inches of soil profile. Most of them are going to be in the above 8 inches. So uh, you're going to see most of that moisture that's below that foot not get used. And so putting things in like chicory, alfalfa, plantain, those deep rooted crops can get down below that, use that moisture and bring it up to the top. Um, a highlight that I always point out if you've done dug enough thistles like I have in my lifetime, if you notice the grass, Bermuda grass in particular, is always taller around a must thistle. And a lot of that's going on is there's nutrient sharing, there's moisture sharing. Uh, those deep tap roots are bringing up moisture and sharing it with the plants around it. Uh, originally, I thought that was competition or the cattle wasn't grazing that grass, but even in paddocks that I haven't grazed before, I've seen, and I've seen the same thing with alfalfa as well, um, where that grass is taller around that plant because of the nutrient sharing and the wash water sharing. So these are some species that I like to focus on uh, in Bermuda grass particularly. Again, these can be used in, in native warm season pastures as well. Uh, I focus on heavy broad leaves, he heavy tap rooted, heavy nitrogen fixing species. Uh, basically, we're trying to replace the species that we're spraying out uh, in past years. So. So alfalfa, vetches, clovers. There's a lot of different clovers out there and we have plenty of webinars that will probably be doing and have done along with YouTube videos uh, of what clovers may work in the best scenario. I will say as kind of a general rule of thumb, as you move into the Western United States and more arid climates, your sweet clovers tend to do better in Bermuda grass. Uh, the red clovers and crimson clovers and ladino clovers tend to do better into higher rainfall climates. So kind of keep that in mind. Chicory and plantain are two of my favorites. Anytime I use alfalfa or a high floating risk plant, uh, I love using those two in combination to help mitigate bloat. In fact, a lot of times I'll see livestock graze those plants before they even touch alfalfa. Peas, I put kind of down there at the bottom. Um, peas are one that are a little bit more niche than the others, depending on your applications. Uh, other species that you can include into this are cereals, uh, annual ryegrass, uh, some, some grassy plants, but be, being that we're on a grass on grass scenario, there's a lot of rye or wheat production that goes into Bermuda grass, but that's going into two nitrogen starved systems. And you end up with this pinch point where you're not gonna, without having to cut out the fertility, you're gonna run into a production issue on biomass. So legumes like going into nitrogen starved scenarios because they're gonna produce their own nitrogen. So I use a few grasses, as you can see kind of in this picture. Uh, I don't usually go over 30% grasses because I have enough dry Bermuda grass underneath for animal consumption as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a research article that's been done. Uh, alfalfa is a great plant. Um, even as you move west, you'll be surprised that you'll get more production out of it than what's typically thought being in a sod base. And so the real benefit of Bermuda is that the evaporation rate is really, really low. It, it has such a, dick, a dense, thick canopy uh, that uh, 
uh, your evaporation rate is very low. And so that makes it much more efficient for perennial legumes like alfalfa to survive in even farther west. So, um, plus we're not paying anymore, so we're not, we're not uh, removing drastic amounts of, of residue. But here's a study that was done of zero nitrogen versus 400, 200 and 400 pounds of nitrogen on Bermuda, and then just Bermuda and alfalfa alone with no fertilizer. And you can see the Bermuda and, Bermuda and alfalfa yielded just as good as the 200 pounds of nitrogen. But keep in mind, it's not just about yield. We do have some quality in there. And so you'll actually have a higher quality forage uh, when you're done um, with the alfalfa and Bermuda in there. But even then I would get more diversity than just alfalfa. The study was just done with alfalfa and Bermuda. Um, <clears throat> So the biggest thing about implementing diversity, I would say, is planning, and this is kind of why we're having this webinar now. Uh, animal rotations are very key, uh, which will lead into whether you're broadcasting the seed, are you drilling the seed, or seed bed prep. Uh, that seed bed prep, I'm not talking about tillage, I'm talking about residue management using livestock. And so uh, certain seeds may require a certain amount of residue, and so that's something that we want to talk about here in this webinar, and we'll have some questions on hopefully at the end. But uh, um, best time for planning is now. Uh, what are you planning on applying with? Are you going to drill the seed in in the fall? Are you going to be broadcasting? Are you broadcasting with animal impact or are you going to broadcast with mechanical impact like a harrow? Uh, this picture actually here is uh, my bro broadcasting unit. It's called a drop seeder. Uh, basically, if you wanted to make one of your own, it's an old conventional drill with no row units. And so I like this as a system for broadcasting because light and fluffy seeds, I know exactly where I'm dropping them. I have a light bar unit that goes with this, and so I can get fairly accurate uh, broadcast applications. With the cone spreader, uh, I have nothing against them other than light and fluffy seeds. Whichever way the wind's blowing is where your seed's going to be at, and you don't know how much you're overlapping. So uh, it's something that I encourage several people that uh, they have went out and basically picked up cheap cheap, cheap, old conventional drills and just take the row units off. And I would say you don't even have to do that. You, you could just uh, leave those on just to get a little bit more soil, seed to soil contact if you want to use that. Um, things to consider when you're seeding into Bermuda, uh, use caution broadcasting large seeds like peas. Peas are really particular on Broadcasting, I highly encourage drilling them. Uh, I've had a little bit of luck with broadcast slash volunteer spring peas um, that I'll talk a little bit more. But large seeds take a lot more moisture to absorb, uh, to germinate versus a small seed. And so canopy height plays a role in your establishment in Bermuda. Uh, if it's tall and thick residue, you're going to have less available sunlight to that seedling on the soil surface. So kind of a rule of thumb that I use is uh, four inches or less. I only use small seeds uh, like your clovers, a little bit of vetch uh, when broadcasting. If that residue starts getting over four inches and it's really, really thick, then I highly recommend drilling in larger seeds like peas. Uh, the benefit of peas is they can grow for several days without sunlight. They have a lot more stored energy being a larger seed. And so they can get up through that thick canopy uh, very, very well. Um, short residue, you're going to have higher evaporation rates. So that's why the peas don't do very good if you're, if you're below that four inches, if you're broadcasting. But uh, uh, on that, but uh, we'll kind of cover that a little bit more here uh, later on. So why is grazing rotation purposeful? Uh, main thing is rest your paddock for seedling establishment. This is a real critical tool um, for getting 
diversity into a Bermuda system. If you're on it constantly, you're going to struggle with getting seedling establishment because animals will pick at the plants that are establishing. Um, also, getting plants to reseed is a beneficial uh, for paddock uh, 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 rotation. So, uh, it also allows you to manage residue uh, for your application type if you're broadcasting or drilling. Um, so you can manage that residue in a little more key way uh, and it allows for stockpiling forages. Um, so stockpiling forages in a perennial system. I uh, love this picture here. Uh, this picture is actually of, of the Ber Bermuda field that I was managing at the time. Uh, it's heavily in spring peas and you can kind of see this is actually taken November 5th. And across the road, you can see the neighbor bailing uh, Bermuda uh, up November 5th. Uh, <clears throat> the, I would say one real key on stockpiling forages in a perennial system is understanding your plant function for profitability. Uh, utilizing unused growing degree days can be a real benefit. And so understanding that perennial system when your peaks and valleys are uh, can be real critical for overseeding. I don't like overlapping a whole lot on seasons. Uh, for instance, I don't like doing sorghum sedans into Bermuda grass very heavily. If I do, it's probably going to be a very thin Bermuda stand or very, uh, very set back Bermuda stand if I was to do that. Uh, some producers have even done a chemical mow with Bermuda grass. It's something that I haven't used because I see it as expense, um, but you can run a quart of Roundup over the top of Bermuda grass and chemically mow it, and it will set it into dormancy uh, for a little while in the summer time frame. Keep in mind this might hurt your Bermuda grass stand if, if you, that's something that you don't want to do, uh, then I wouldn't recommend it. But uh, we've had some producers do that and have produced a lot of summer forage with sorghums, sunflowers, and added diversity into that system by doing that. But uh, again, talk to your crop consultant, your chemical rep before you do something like that uh, on, that, uh, on that particular subject. So um, with the warm season perennial function, this is the biggest thing that I highlight in understanding and, and why I kind of point out that photo is my neighbors uh, so happening to bale uh, forage or Bermuda grass in November. Well, I, I hate to say that, but uh, it's not doing a lot of good baling Bermuda grass in November versus just letting it stand and grazing where it's at. Because a way that a summer perennial functions is in the summer time frame, they are going to be building up their root systems, the carbohydrates, uh, in that uh, June, July, and August. Well, if you're going back in in October, November, those plants are starting to decline in carbohydrates in the top part of their plant and going, they're putting those carbohydrates in the root system for overwintering. And so that's a real key point to pay attention, pay attention to because your quality is also going to drop in that plant as those carbohydrates drop from the leaves and go down to the roots. That's just how a perennial plant is functioning on overwintering. Uh, and then again, it uses those carbohydrates in the spring to shoot new leaves. And so if we hurt that, uh, you, have, you run much higher risk for drought. Uh, you run much higher risk for winter kill, uh, whether that's a winter annual or a cool season perennial will do the same thing. They are storing up the root system before the winter time frame. And so I put this chart in here, um, understanding that function, and I added down at the bottom one additional curve to this chart uh, to kind of help show you where I am stockpiling forages and using annuals in a perennial system uh, to show those growth patterns. So I'm um, looking at August, September timeframe, 
Uh, Bermuda grass is starting to fade out. It, you'll be getting some competition. You'll be getting a little bit of regrowth. Uh, it depends on your moisture content of when exactly you may go in. You might not go in until October time frame and do a winter annual. Uh, but more times than not, I've seen really good opportunity from August 15th uh, through September of establishing a large seeded uh, spring annual that will grow very quickly because you're going into warm soils and it will winter kill out. That, that spring annual is all about seed production. So it's putting all of its energy resources into the top of that plant. At the same time, those perennials are taking all of their energy resources and putting it into their root system. And so you can stockpile much higher quality forage other than perennials uh, going into the winter time frame. And so I use something like spring peas and Bermuda grass in the, in the fall um, for stockpiling. You get higher protein, you, know, you get higher energy, uh, you get better utilization in the winter time frame, and I'll come back in December and January and graze that, and uh, you'll get better utilization on that perennial uh, stockpile. Um, so that's something that kind of keeps in mind uh, of your growth patterns, whether it's a Bermuda grass, Bahia, uh, or a uh, warm season. Uh, you see the same dip in the chart above uh, that where that warm season, big blue stems, Indian grass, they, they really drop down in August and September. And so you have a really good opportunity to go in there and seed if you catch some fall moisture uh, to implement some protein sources into those stands. So um, if you have a really good pristine native pasture, more than likely you're not going to over, need to overseed that. Um, but primarily, uh, there's been a lot of native pastures that have been sprayed out for years. We've eliminated a lot of the legumes. We haven't had rotation. And so we've lost a lot of that diversity uh, that would uh, maintain animals through the winter on, on, uh, on that diversity. So uh, the spring annuals can really provide a good uh, winter food source to reduce your minerals and your protein. So this is kind of a picture here. Uh, this was taken on November 5th. Uh, this was started about August 15th. There was no burn down on the Bermuda grass. As you can see, the peas did really, really, really good on this. Uh, this winter killed, started flowering about mid-November. In fact, I think you can see a few flowers there uh, in the background. Um, this winter killed about uh, uh, the end of November and was grazed in January uh, with a no hay, no protein, no mineral uh, system on those animals. So what are the consequences of, of cutting back or of, of cutting back these inputs? Uh, less Bermuda grass production. Um, I would say that you're not going to get less Bermuda grass production, in my opinion, um, from what I've done on my own operation. However, you are going to reallocate a lot of that production of both Bermuda grass and other annuals and perennials uh, over a longer period of time. So you're cutting out that hay, you're cutting out those inputs. You don't have to cut hay, haul hay, and then bring hay back to the cattle. Um, there's some really good opportunities for cutting out the protein cubes or protein sources. Uh, in that livestock system for overwintering by having that diversity there uh, and even reduced mineral consumption in that winter time frame because you're getting broad leaves in there that accumulate a lot different micronutrients than what grasses will. Uh, this is my biggest highlight on, on the production. This is after two years of overseeding Bermuda grass. On the top picture in the left uh, was kind of the soil that we started with uh, on overseeding. The bottom left corner was just a rotation only system. They cut out the fertility, we cut out the spraying of the, the herbicides, and we just did daily moves on this. 
you can see that topsoil did start building. There was about an inch, inch and a half of topsoil uh, that was starting to build back. I was seeing about one earthworm per shovelful. However, where we did the overseeding right across the fence, uh, drastic changes in the soil where I could step a spade in all the way uh, in the winter time frame. And uh, about three to four inches of topsoil was, was changing there. Uh, but the larger notice was eight to 10 earthworms per shovelful. And how I phrase this, I guess I should say is, um, we can kill a cow with too much pro or too much uh, fiber in their diet. And so earthworms in biology are, are a lot alike in the same sense is they need protein or they need nitrogen to digest the, the carbon that's being exudated by that high carbon to ratio Bermuda grass. And so when we get those uh, legumes back into that system, uh, they become a lot more effective. They repopulate much better. They, they are performing much better because those uh, legumes are back into that system. So other consequences, which is kind of my pun uh, of cutting back is more soil organic matter, better water infiltration, more earthworms, and best of all, no high maintenance relationship. So um, that's kind of my contact info. Um, I'm kind of opening it up early for questions. Um, we'd answer all, any and all questions on this. Uh, Noah, do you have any there? Yeah, um, I guess the first one here from Tucker Griffith was, do you have any bloat issues? I have not had any bloat issues. Um, biggest thing is diversity. So if you go in and seed something, uh, say alfalfa and, and all you get is an alfalfa stand then you run higher risk grazing rotation and and my my presentation didn't tell you the how to rotate near as well as dale has done in the past i uh, highly encourage you to look that up um, but rotating on legumes uh, rotating in a later maturity stage will mitigate bloat uh, so you hardly run into bloat in that scenario, higher diversity. Those pl plants that uh, provide tannins do help tie up uh, your proteins and make them bypass proteins. And so rather than breaking down in the rumen, they're gonna break down in the small intestine. That animal becomes more efficient. There's no methane production because it's breaking down in the small intestine. And so uh, uh, highly, Highly unlikely if you're running into a lot of diversity, but I also let things mature along faster or farther before I graze them. I don't really like grazing lush, lush plants because I think there's other consequences with health issues, uh, especially too, having too high of a protein diet uh, can be much more harsh on the kidneys of an animal because naturally the nitrogen is going to pass through the urine on the animal. And so those kidneys are sorting out all that extra nitrogen. Well, when once that animal starts getting scours from too much nitrogen or too much protein, uh, we're clogging up those kidneys with all the excess nitrogen and protein. And when you clog up your kidneys, you're shutting down your immune system. That the animal's not going to function as well uh, immune-wise. Uh, as a higher energy diet. So um, I try to graze things later in maturity than earlier in maturity always. So you just don't run the bloat risks with that, so. Okay, um, next question is from Alan. Mm -hmm. He says that they have uh, 20 acres of coastal Bermuda Mm -hmm. But it's it's covered in wildflowers and Mexican hats. We're not sure what to do without okay. spraying or burning. Okay. Um, so Mexican hats and wildflowers, those are indicator species of uh, the, that soil sealing. Uh, that would be a natural response to rest. Uh, Mexican hats typically respond to compacted soils. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to go in with legumes 
uh, in there, but uh, uh, more than likely it holds water. Uh, it's limited on oxygen. And so incorporating some legumes in there to get the biology functioning to get more oxygen in that soil, you'll see uh, even better response out of the grasses. But uh, uh, those, those are kind of indicator species that uh, uh, that system is healing. And so those are actually more summer uh, and spring species, um, typically. Uh, so you could be looking at spring interceding into that coastal Bermuda uh, in that time frame, because that's an indicator that there's available nutrients uh, in that system to add those annuals in. And I wouldn't say that you know, I would purposely try to choke out those wildflowers. I, I would leave them in because they're going to have other benefits. But I would say add to the diversity of that and get some legumes in there. Okay. Um, you had talked about obviously a lot of the things that interceded well. What things have you tried that just did not work and <laughs> would not try again? <laughs> Perfect question. I'm glad somebody asked that. I didn't, I didn't have a long enough uh, presentation to show all the failures that I've done. Uh, probably the biggest, biggest one that I would say to pay attention to is your residue and what you're seeding into. And that's one that I tried to highlight a little bit, probably didn't do the best job of. Um, your small seeds just don't have a lot of stored energy. They don't have that physical capability to grow through residue or lots of residue anyways, and so versus a large seed. And so understanding of what you're seeding into uh, is probably my biggest mistake that I've made. I've seeded a lot of small seeds into really, really thick Bermuda and about the only spot that I'd get them was where the pocket gophers dug in exposed bare soil. Everywhere the Bermuda grass thatch stayed really, really thick in that winter time frame, did not get very many small seeds in those areas. The vetch, the peas did all right in there uh, because they could grow for several days without, without getting immediate sunlight. But those small seeds need immediate sunlight once they germinate. And so, and the same goes for your small seed weeds mare's tail, pigweeds, they all need immediate sunlight. And so if you have patches of mare's tail, more than likely that was a bald spot, like a terrace, to the top of a terrace or around a pond dam. Uh, those are all indicator species that they were, there was a bald spot there at one point. And so it's, it uh, responded with small, small seeded weeds. Um, so just mimicking mother nature, uh, but, uh, Another failure probably uh, is just trying, I've tried some things that really don't belong in my climate. Um, red clover isn't really one that thrives in my climate in Southwest Oklahoma. Now you get east of I-35, uh, red clover does really good. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's impossible to have it, but uh, it's definitely more, a, more responsive to a higher rainfall uh, climate. I would say the other thing that I would add into there, if you are maintaining a hay program, I would be highly careful of sweet clovers in a mix. I would keep it more towards veg and alfalfa. And I wouldn't mind chicory and plantain in a bale. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, the sweet clover in a bale uh, can cause, if it molds, can cause toxins similar to warfarin. And so that can be highly potent in a bale. So I would, I would avoid sweet clovers in a haying system if you were to maintain hay. Uh, but again, we we're trying to cut all that out. So. Okay. Um, this comes from Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. Amazing name. Is there a problem <laughs> with Bermuda grass thatch getting too coarse and thick over time with no mechanical mowing and causing problems with legume seed germination? Can you say that again? Uh, is there a problem with Bermuda grass thatch getting too coarse and thick over time without mechanical term or mechanical mowing and causing problems with legume seed germination? 
Yeah, it that that would be in the case of if you're trying to do small seeds. Now, if you have large seeds like peas, uh, uh, peas or vetches, um, they'll grow through that. And the more the more legumes you get into that base, the more earthworms you are going to get to to uh, consume that residue and break down that residue faster. So naturally, naturally, uh, your perennial plant residue never got mowed uh, in a native system. It got trampled uh, or it got uh, grazed and went through the animal system. And so I try to do the same way uh, with Bermuda grass and treat it like a native system. And you're going to see actually native grasses move into that system once you start start treating it like a native system. If you want a Bermuda grass patch um, to stay a monoculture uh, Bermuda grass, uh, grazing and and or mowing every 30 days is going to keep it in the in a monoculture Bermuda grass, but then you get stuck into that high, high input system. Um, but uh, I wouldn't see it being a problem. I would just see it as a change in management or rotation to if I got too much buildup, uh, then I would bring the cattle in and make a higher impact. Uh, now that may not be buy more cows, but that may be bring on more animals temporarily uh, like stalker cattle, if, if you're going ahead and doing all the rotations and finding that you don't have enough cattle to cover all that ground, uh, at that time, uh, to stay ahead of that thatch, then using annual animals in a marketing scheme, uh, is a safer bet to play than buying animals. I, that was my other big mistake is I bought animals and I didn't use annual animals when I had extra forage. So <laughs> that was my, that was my big mistake. So mother nature, uh, uh, corrected me on that one. So as, as she tends to do, yep. uh, if the alfalfa and clover sprout establish and the chicory and plantain establishment is intermittent, what would you do? Is the overseeded grass going to be enough diversity with rotation to avoid cow health problems? Okay, so the intermittent chicory, okay. Say yeah, that if, again. if the clover and the alfalfa establish well, but your chicory and your plantain with the, you know, obviously having them in there for the anti-bloat mm -hmm. abilities, if those are more intermittent, is that something you need to be worried about? Um, that that would be a concern, that would be a concern, yes, yes. So if you don't have the broad leaves, and, and if you have, look out there and it doesn't have to be just chicory and plantain. If you have mare's tail, you probably saw in some of my pictures, I have a lot of prickly lettuce. Cattle eat that prickly lettuce just as fast as they do the vetch and alfalfa. Um, at certain stages, they don't eat it all the time, but they eat it at the flowering stages very, very well. And so if you have some other broad leads out there, then, then your, your risk mitigates. So part of its dilution, Part of its plant maturity. If all you have is a lot of alfalfa um, and you know 50% alfalfa, 50% grass, managing that rotation in a daily move manner, um, I'm not concerned about it because then you can control when they're getting exposed to that. Moving them in the afternoon, making sure that alfalfa is in a later maturity, so 25% bloom or later, uh, you'll mitigate that bloat risk. So you don't necessarily need to have those chicory and plantain in there. I like it as a fail seed. Um, and I noticed my animals graze those species before they even touch alfalfa. So I know that they're getting those micronutrients they need to uh, properly handle the, that extra protein. But um, your bloat risks are more likely to happen if you are uh, just a just going to kick out and let them have a whole pat, you know, two cows on 20 acres paddock, and they have free choice on everything. If you create a competitive scenario uh, in that rotation, they're going to consume uh, a little bit of everything. So. 
Okay. What would your, what, yeah, sorry. What would be your recommendations for pastures utilizing rotation with equine and small herd of cows that have all psych clover? We recently seeded with a broadcast seeder using a grass mix of Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, and rye grass. But I want to add more broadleaf species to improve grazing quality and opportunity. Mm -hmm. So your equine are really going to, both, both your equine and, and uh, did you say, was there pastured pigs in there as well? Or is it just equine? Yeah, I think it was just equine and a small herd of cattle. Okay, okay. Um, so the, typically horses are, are equine animals. I, I have donkeys, I have miniature donkeys. They eat more broad leaves than my cows and probably some people's sheep. They eat a lot of thistles. <laughs> um, so it kind of depends on that animal. If that animal's been raised up on forages or if that animal's just had hay brought to its entire life, there, there's a difference in that mentality of that animal and there's a, some training in there as well. Um, with the cattle in there and the equine, I wouldn't be concerned adding chicory and plantain in there. Uh, more than likely that horse is not going to consume it. And, and we're not talking a gi ginormous amount of broadleaves. We're talking you know, 10% to 30% of a stand. So there's still enough other species out there for that animal to manage its diet. Um, I wouldn't try to get over a 30% stand of chicory or plantain because that's not your main energy component. Your grasses are gonna be your main energy component. I look at them as a supplemental, like a mineral program. And so, uh, uh, that's kind of how I look at the chicory and plantain. In fact, Virginia, I believe it's the University of Virginia uh, or Pennsylvania had a study on up to 30% of a stand of chicory increased your overall grass, grass alone yield because of that nutrient sharing capability and water sharing capability um, in that stand. So if there's any if there's broadly over 30% of a, of a stand, then I have a little bit more of a concern uh, just, just for overall production reasons. But uh, typically we don't reach that with the broadleaves once we start doing the system. Okay. Um, Jack also says they have a huge problem in Southwest Arkansas with dog fennel and woolly Creighton goat leaves. Okay, yep, yep. So. Woolly croton, yes, very woody species. Um, it's one that tends to like sandy soils, but I think I've seen it on about every soil type. Um, dog fennel, I'm not super familiar with, uh, but I would just look at its growth patterns and try to find out what is it capitalizing on. Woolly croton, being a high woody species, deep tap, very deep tap root. Uh, something that's probably cycling nutrients from really, really deep. Uh, again, I would look at its growth pattern and try to mimic that. Why is it taking advantage of certain, uh, certain scenarios? And, and may, it may be just rest. Uh, rest could be the answer before you're seeding something. Uh, change in management be, can be cheaper than just throwing any kind of input out there on it. So uh, that's kind of how I would look at it. Okay. Um, I guess I have kind of a question here. You talked about using Roundup on the Bermuda. Is that something mm -hmm. that would pretty much take take care of that problem for good, or does that just stunt it for a while and then it will come back a year after that? So Bermuda grass and Roundup is actually labeled as chemical mowing for it. It takes actually five quarts or six quarts of Roundup to kill physically kill the whole root system of Bermuda grass uh, I've had some pr producers again I'm not a huge fan of this just because we're adding an input I'm not a huge fan of using roundup over the top and it uh, forages anyways uh, if I can mitigate it I don't get me wrong I still use it um, but I try to minimize it as much as possible and so uh, 
I haven't really used it. I try to look around it and find other ways to diversify, whether that's animal impact, whether that's overseeding. Um, but uh, you can spray one, one, maybe two quarts around up over the top. I'm not a chemical rep, so consult your chemical rep before you do it. Um, but you can spray one, one quart over the top of Bermuda grass, as long as it's a healthy stand and it will set it dormant for about a month to six weeks before it starts coming back out again. And so I've had some producers do that, establish warm seasons over the top of it. And then the Bermuda grass would come back up in it in September timeframe and get a full recovery. And so they've done that pretty, pretty successfully. I'm not a huge fan of that just because I don't have the equipment and I don't want, you know, I hate doing those extra expenses. So for something that you already have. Yeah. Um, this is from Patrick. I live in central Texas and he has Brandon clay. Mm -hmm. They don't receive a lot of rain during the summer and he's trying to find something that would compete against Bermuda. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of talked about all of these things working kind of in synergy with the Bermuda grass. Is there anything mm -hmm. out compete Bermuda? You can, you can choke Bermuda grass back by doing what it, taking away what it loves and that's nitrogen. And so if you, if you start cutting out nitrogen completely, it's going to start naturally choking itself out. It, it almost smothers itself. Uh, if you, go cold turkey on nitrogen and don't do anything. No overseeding or anything. Uh, I will throw some cereals in there and, and you kind of have to do a little bit of fertility. If you're really trying to smother it out, uh, if you do a little bit of fertility and get some cereals going in the fall, not a lot because you don't want a lot, of, a lot of nitrogen left over, but you kind of need it, that to get them started. Uh, you can put a lot of pressure uh, along uh, on Bermuda in the spring time frame. Your cereal rye, triticales, uh, winter oats have been probably the best for me on a no fertility program for uh, going into Bermuda. Uh, in my experience, it seems like they tolerate it better. I'm not sure why, uh, but they seem to uh, do better. And so a good stand of winter oats in your region um, would put some pressure on it. I wouldn't mind. I've, I've done hairy vetch. I've had some guys claim that hairy vetch have choked their stands out, but I have not had that happen just because you get a surplus of nitrogen if you have a really thick stand of hairy vetch. But I would be careful about grazing a very thick stand of hairy vetch too. Uh, because there are other toxicities with that. So it, it depends on what your other goals are in line with that, if you're still wanting grazing out of it and choking it out. But but I, it's number one nutrient that it loves is is nitrogen. And so taking away that nitrogen, putting something in that, in that spring, uh, that winter and spring uh, gap before it gets going, um, will help suppress it. It'll still grow some that first year, but a couple of years into it, it'll really choke it out. Okay, Kelsey asks, would pasture pigs help the situation with all site clover in the equine and cattle pasture rotation, specifically mm -hmm. utilizing a ground pig grazer like coon coon? Yep. Um, Actually, if you're trying to diversify, I'm not afraid to use, uh, you aren't necessarily, you know, the Cooney Cooney don't really uh, tear up the pasture. And that's why a lot of grazers have, have went to that. I'm not, I'm not completely sold on that you need Cooney Cooney uh, because most pigs won't root unless they have surplus water or no, no other feed. Uh, but I do take advantage of that. I run some pasture pigs myself, and I do take advantage of uh, that open bare ground opportunity to diversify. So if there's an area that is a monoculture Bermuda, uh, I did this this year, I've seeded some alfalfa in the spring into that that did really, really well, where they rooted it up and disturbed that system. Um, now it's bare for a little while and the Bermuda grass kind of came back with it, but it definitely opened up that thatch 
um, um, to uh, add that diversity in. And so I think PICS could be a beneficial tool for diversifying a system if they're managed in a way. So, um, but uh, um, I wouldn't say that you necessarily need any specific species of pig or, you know, I think you could use about any of them. And so long as you're filling that opportunity of what they open up with. Otherwise, Mother Nature is just going to fill it for you. And, you know, it could be more owls like clover because there's probably a pretty good seed bank there. But, uh, Okay. Um, we have done a webinar on fescue before. Mm -hmm. and I know this is a Bermuda topic, but have you heard or had any experience of doing this with other native perennial grasses? Yeah, so uh, we do quite a bit, actually. And so I prefer doing, say, if you have Croatian uh, blue stems or KR blue stem, uh, these improved blue stems. Uh, I do like using that, uh, the system in that uh, as well. In fact, it's a little easier because the residue management uh, is a little easier. Being that they are bunch grasses, that leaves an opportunity for legumes and broadleaves to grow inside uh, that canopy of grasses. And so native grasses are a lot easier to intercede uh, the the clovers, the, the small seeds. I would say that the Bermuda grass is probably the toughest on the small seeds because of that residue management. And so, uh, yeah, no, it, it definitely, definitely is an opportunity. And going back and looking at the chart that I shared, kind of talking about those growing periods, you can see your natives kind of have a similar window as Bermuda grass, but that, that thick, thatch is not as present um, when you're trying to germinate that seedling. So um, there's some really good opportunities there. Okay. Well, with that, I think we've got all the questions answered. Um, do you have any final notes or something that we didn't cover? Uh, it should be good. Um, like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, but uh, the biggest thing about getting into interceding on this is that management does start now. And that's kind of what I wanted to highlight it now is, uh, you know, we're still a hundred degrees. It's hard to believe that we're thinking about cool seasons, but uh, um, that rotation and planning uh, can be really critical to be prepped for when that rain starts to come again in the fall. If you're really dry right now, um, having that opportunity and being prepared for that opportunity. A lot of times uh, 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 we miss opportunities just because we, we didn't have any planning in advance and I've done it myself. And so I've, I wish I've done some, some other scenarios before, but I just wasn't ready. Uh, I see Jack Comer. My email address is Brett, B-R-E-T-T -T, at greencoverseed.com. And if you feel like I haven't quite answered your questions 100% or still want a little more in depth, uh, feel free to give me a call to my cell phone is 402-705-9916. So. Yeah, very good. Well, Brett, thanks for your time. Uh, next week, we have not completely decided. We've got two topics that we want to cover. One is the top 10 questions in cover crops. And the other one is what to plant after wheat harvest. So we are, we're trying to decide which one we think is most pertinent for next week, but we will definitely get that out. It'll be uh, next Tuesday at 530. So thank you guys for attending. Brett, thank you for your time. And thank you. Ability to answer these questions. So you guys have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks everyone.